So I think everyone now knows what's going on. So keep, keep microphones muted during the presentations. Uh, and then at the end, when it's time for questions, so there'll be the five minutes for sort of question time between the talks, then if you can raise hands, yes, hopefully you all know now how to do that. Depends on what version of Zoom you have, but you can raise your hand uh, either in the participants list, there's the, the icon or you get a, uh, yeah. I'm not quite sure why there's so many different versions of Zoom. I think they do this just to confuse us. <laughs> um, so you know, find or the, the, uh, whatever is, there's an icon somewhere. Uh, so raise hand and then I can ask you. Uh, but if you have problems with microphone, which I had yesterday when I tried to ask a question, for example, either we'll come back to you or you can put it in the chat uh, and we'll sort of work it out from there. And after the session, it's there's a chance to meet the speakers. There are links on the uh, website for the meeting as to where to find those rooms. Okay, so it is now sort of 10 o'clock. So I'm sure a few people will still arrive, but uh, the first, our first speaker is Jimena Gorfindel from the Open University in the UK. And she's gonna tell us about our matrix approaches to molecular photoionization. Okay, so thank you, Jimena. Thank you, Graham. I'm gonna um, start sharing my screen. And um, okay, I think does that marvelous? There you go. That that should be yep. okay. So yes, I'm going to talk about our matrix approaches to molecular photoionization. You want to make it full and screen? before it, you made it, you want to make it full screen? It, it, it is full screen. You're not seeing it full screen? Well, uh, we've got the sort of the next slide and the sort of screen. Brilliant. Page. It's not how it's supposed to be. Uh, <laughs> I thought it was okay before. Yes, it, it wasn't. Uh, it's fine. We can see your slides. No, I know. I, I know. I think I know how to solve the problem. Uh, just bear with me because I had the problem before. Um, you're going to have to have. Sorry. You're going to have. To, I'm sorry about this. We tried it before and I thought it was fine. Mm -hmm. um, I am going to do this and um, how about now? And it's not coming up quite yet. Okay, bear with me a second and how about now? I haven't got your screen yet. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, people. Um, let's try oh, that's a that's third time and hopefully Perfect. third time lucky. That's the one. Yes. Excellent. Okay, so I'm going to talk about our matrix approaches to molecular photoionization. And before I tell you um, a little bit about um, the work we do and the methods and the software that we use, what I want to do is acknowledge the people that have involved, been involved in the work. So the development of the software and, and performance of the calculations, it's a, it's a project that um, included a number of people. And particularly over the last few years, we had a collaboration with people at Queen's University Belfast, Hugo van der Hart, uh, Greg Armstrong, Andrew Brown, and others, um, where we did a lot of the development of the codes. Um, we also have, however, people beyond the UK that are involved in, in the code development, Kara Hufek in Prague and Alex Harvey um, in Berlin, who did some work some years ago. And fundamentally, a lot of the codes or part of the codes that I'm going to talk about, the time independent codes, a lot of the recent development was done by um, Zdenek Machine, who was working with me at the Open University and then moved to Prague, where he has his own group. And Jakub Benda, who was a postdoc with me and now is a postdoc in Zdenia's group in Prague. And of course, we have funding for an, from a number of sources. So why um, the R matrix method? Well, the R matrix method enables the basically the separation of the two difficult parts of the problem, if you want. On the one hand, you can describe the short range um, effects, the exchange, the correlation effects, and on the other hand, the continuum. And that makes it very appropriate for all of the atomic and molecular processes that involve, say, a particle in the continuum. So for the description of the exchange and correlation, you can use well-established computational chemistry techniques, which makes it easy. You use tools that people have developed already, methodology that people have developed already. And the R matrix, R matrix approaches, although they come from nuclear physics, they have been using atomic and molecular physics for 50 years or more. 
And the advantage there is that there's been computational implementations generally available since the 80s. And when I say generally available, what I mean is software that was developed by a group of people and was shared relatively freely by a number of researchers, those involved in the development and those who were not. And what does that enable was the creation of a group, both of developers and users. And over the years, the number of developers have increased and decreased depending on funding and situations and so on. But it has meant that there has always been a certain you know, group of people with expertise in the codes. And having a community of users brings two things. Uh, one, the fact that people test the codes and whenever there are problems, bugs, etc., these tend to be reported. Uh, and on the other hand, the fact that if you have a number of people using the codes, it's worth putting the effort into the development, or at least it feels that you're gonna, several people are gonna reap the rewards of the development that you're doing. Now, the fact that codes based on our matrix methods have existed for um, several decades doesn't mean that those, of course, are the codes that we use nowadays, yes? Um, because there's newer challenges, newer processes that people want to study, um, newer experiments that we want to compare with, and also because, of course, over the years, the computational power having, has increased significantly, we have had to rewrite the suites. And the project that I was talking about before, UK RAMP, for example, did a lot of rewriting of several of the codes. So let me tell you a little bit more about these R matrix based uh, suites and what we now have in the UK collaborating outside as well is what is called the High End Computing Consortium on Atomic Codes, it's called UK Amor. And basically what we do there is try to coordinate the development of the several uh, UK based um, our matrix suites. So these are time independent and time dependent codes. They're interconnected. And the main ones, or the ones that are basically suites, they're not individual codes, they're suites, and the, they're listed here. So we have the UK ML Plus code that I will talk about. This is a time independent molecular suite. Um, there is the equivalent for atoms or uh, ionic atoms, which is time independent, the time independent atomic suite. And that's mainly these days. Uh, maintained, developed by Connor Valence at Queen's University, Belfast. Then there are the time dependence codes, the RMT, the matrix with time, that is mainly developed by Andrew Brown and Hugo van der Hart and Queen's University, Belfast. And this is partly based on earlier codes that were developed there by Ken Taylor and his collaborators. Um, we have a library, GBTO Leave, to calculate molecular integrals, and this is an independent library. We'll talk about it uh, more later. And what we also have that is now in development is an R matrix based um, heavy particle collision code as well. And as you will see later, some of these are interconnected. So what's the basic idea of the R matrix method? As I said before, there's a separation of the problems uh, or, or the two parts of the problem, and this is based on the separation of space. When you have your free electron being a photoionized electron or an electron, for example, in an electron scattering process, because the UK more plus code started a code to describe electron and positron scattering from molecules. So when this electron is close enough to your molecule, to your target, um, exchange and correlation are important. So if you describe, want to describe uh, the system, the N plus one electron system accurately, you need to do it. It's explicitly multi-electronic. You need a multicentric expansion. And we use basically quantum chemistry techniques. However, after a certain distance, from beyond a certain distance from the center of mass of the molecule that we define by an R matrix radius, um, the electron becomes distinguishable and therefore exchange is negligible and correlation becomes something very simple. You basically can describe it as a polarization of your target or residual ion from your, by your free electron. So in that case, you can treat explicitly only one electron and the interaction between this electron and the molecular target can be uh, simplified and described as a long range multipolar interaction. We work all the time in, in these methods with molecules within the fixed nuclear approximation. So the, the nuclear motion is not coupled. So as I mentioned before, we have time independent and time dependent codes, and we can perform ionization calculations with both sets of codes. So to do time independent calculations, we use the UK Armour Plus suite only, and these calculations are less demanding than the time dependent ones, obviously. And what we can calculate is single photoionization uh, observable, so um, angle resolved and final state resolved cross sections, asymmetry parameters, um, 
photoelectron angular distributions, dyes and orbitals, etc. There is in the cone of functionality, and to hear about that, you're going to have to wait for a couple of talks because Jakub Ben is going to talk about it later this morning. Now, when it comes to the time dependent calculations, you need to use both the RMT code that I mentioned before and the UKMO plus code. And the, the implementation of the molecular, the treatment of molecules in the RMT code is, diff is recent. So, so far, we've only studied uh, small molecules in linearly polarized fields, relatively simple processes, but the potential to treat um, processes beyond the perturbative regime is huge. There's a lot of work that has been done on atoms, uh, for, for example, for arbitrary polarization, uh, high harmonic generation, et cetera. And you've got an example there on the slides on the right of what is three photon ionization of potassium. So that is a comparison between experimental and theoretical momentum uh, distribution for counter-rotating circularly polarized pulses. So this, it's work um, of, again, Queen's University Belfast with um, Yaku um, and other collaborators. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, the theory uh, of the both types of calculations, and then hopefully I will show you um, some results. So as we've uh, heard uh, so far, the main quantity to calculate here is the molecular frame uh, partial wave dipoles. And, in a, you know, and these can be calculated uh, calculating the transition moments between an initial bound state uh, and a final a set of final bound and continuum states of the neutral target of the M plus one system. So in our case, we expand those functions in terms of what we call our matrix functions or so the linear combinations of these our matrix functions. And that's what I've done. I've included that here. So what we see is that we have to calculate the transition moments between an initial bound state and all of these bound and continuous states. So from these uh, quantities, we can calculate cross sections, we can calculate asymmetry parameters. And if we want to calculate photoelectron angular distributions, those again can be calculated in terms of the molecular frame partial wave dipoles using Wigner matrices transformation, etc. So the, a lot of the physics uh, comes from uh, describing well these R matrix basis functions. And these are calculated in the inner region of these R matrix problem. And to generate these, you need three components. You need to describe the residual cationic states of the system. Um, and for these, we tend to use CAS-SEF methods. So we will describe the wave function in terms of a configuration interaction where the orbitals have been um, optimized at the CAS-SEF level. Now, this is a closed carbon expansion of the type that you saw, for example, in the x presentation yesterday. And the second set of terms is what we call L square functions. And these describe correlation polarization. And for these, these are expanded in terms of the orbitals that we have used before for the description of the cationic states. So we have some rules for which kind of configurations need to go into these L square functions, depending on how we have generated these uh, cationic states and how much of the polarization we need to describe, etc. The next ingredient is the description of the continuum of the electron in the continuum. And for that, we use something that we call continuum orbitals that are one particle orbitals. And these are expanded in a combination or independently B splines and Gaussian type orbitals. So this again may remind you of the x talk yesterday. And what we do is something similar, but we have more functionality in our course. And this is where this GBTO lib that I mentioned before comes into play because we decided that we wanted to develop this as a separate entity and all of the integral calculations, something that uh, is object oriented, is a parallel library, and that it was designed in this way so it could not only just be used with the UKRMO plus codes, but it could be used by other developers who wanted to use it. So for example, we had a couple of years ago, a project with Vitali Aberbuk and, and Marco Ruberti at Imperial College, where we interfaced the GBTO lib library with their base plans um, ADC code. So this GBTO library will do all of the integral and orbital operations that you need for this kind of calculation. So it will calculate the one and two particle integrals between Gaussians and base plans. It will um, transform them from the basis of atomic um, functions on, onto molecular orbitals. It will be perform uh, orthogonalization of the orbitals, et cetera, et cetera. And what our library allows us to do is two things. We can describe the continuum using a mix of Gaussians and bisplines. So if you look at the picture below here, uh, what you can see is, that, for example, we use Gaussians 
for the molecular orbitals. That's always the case because then we can use the expertise of quantum chemistry. So we will have a Gaussian here. And to describe, for example, and to describe the continuum, what we do is we put Gaussians on the center of mass of the molecule. These are diffuse Gaussians that will describe the continuum up to a certain radius given by this. And from that onwards, we use this plane. Now, we wanted to be able to do calculations without having to use Gaussians for the continuum. And that is also possible with a code. So the example, the case, will, it's shown by this figure where we have the same Gaussian on the atoms, but in this case, the whole of the radial part of the continuum orbital is described by these planes over the whole range. Now, why did we want to do that? Um, there's two reasons. First is why not? For small systems, uh, you pay, of course, a computational cost if you're only using these planes, but it's feasible. And the examples I will show you, many of them use these planes only continuum basis. But on the other hand, from the experience of using Gaussians in electron scattering, we know that sometimes Gaussians are not very good when this radius has to be quite large. If you're using Gaussians here, they're quite diffuse, and therefore you need to use your Gaussians to describe the continuum for quite a long range here. The quality of the description can be poor, and therefore we wanted to make sure that we could solve the problem by using these planes for um, a, a radius closer to the bound Gaussians. So um, to perform calculations, you can see here on the left, um, the uh, basically a flow chart of what what programs we use this looks very complicated it is a little bit but nowadays we don't have to do this manually Carl Hufex some years ago got fed up with having to do this manually because he was doing calculations for hundreds of geometries not for photoionization he was doing associative detachment studies I think and um, therefore he wrote some set of Perl scripts that have been modified since I have made calculations geez. So um, the, the other thing I wanted to highlight from, from this is that we do not perform the calculations of the orbitals, be them hard to focus, we want to do simple calculations or a CAS SCF orbitals within the codes. What we use is we read these uh, from a file generated by external codes. So this file is in Molden format. So Molden format is very general and can be in principle generated by any um, quantum chemistry code. We systematically use more print of code that you have to pay for, but it's reasonably cheap. Uh, you can also use Cypher that is freeware. It hasn't got all the functionality of say more pro, presumably more cast, but you can use it as well. Um, the suite is a Fortran to uh, 95 codes with some 2003 functionalities and we, and it needs standard libraries to compile and optionally some other. So for example, the Hamiltonian build that is done by this code is called SCAT-CI or it's parallel implementation in PI SCAT-CI. If you use CAT-CI, you can either use Calapac to perform the Hamiltonian diagonalization, which can be for big problems, the, the bottleneck of the calculation. Or if you really have a huge uh, Hamiltonian, you may be able to use um, um, the SLEPSI for the calculation. So the last thing I wanted to point out is this CATSI integrals program is basically a relatively simple program that uses this GBTO lib that I have mentioned before. So what about the time dependent calculations? Okay, in this case, we use RMT and what you do is you solve the time dependence Rödinger equation. So in the inner region, this is the equation that you solve. And of course, your Hamiltonian is the sum of a term that is field um, free, of course, and then a term that includes the interaction with the field. Our now time dependent wave functions are solved again as an expansion on the R matrix basis functions. And these are generated by the UPRMO plus code. So you can see here that for time dependent calculations, we need both codes. For the atomic case, they use another code. If they want to do RMT calculations for the molecular case, you use UPRMO plus. So to solve these problem, we have a set of differential equations that have, can be written in matrix form. The Hamiltonian elements indeed are linked to the transition dipoles. And not here, though, whereas before the transition dipoles that we were looking at were those between the initial state of our molecule and all of the R matrix basis function. In this case, what you have to get is the transition dipoles between all of these R matrix basis functions. So the data that you need is significantly larger than from the time independent codes. Um, as I am talking, I realized that in different slides I jumped from having the M plus one superscript here or not, but these are always the R matrix basis functions. Um, okay, so the S matrix uh, has some surface terms and the surface terms are basically calculated as a product of the derivative of the outer region radial wave function and something that is called the boundary amplitudes. So the boundary amplitudes are basically the projection of these R matrix basis functions on some 
wave functions that describe the state of the residual ion and the angular behavior of the free electron. This is what we call the channel functions in a way. And to perform this differentiation, what we actually need to do is we, need, we do it numerically. So in the case of time dependent calculations, when we set the boundary, the radius that separates the inner and the outer region, we actually need to put it a bit further away that we would do it for time independent calculations. And the reason for that is because we need a range, a set of bond lengths in which we calculate this numerically and the amplitudes numerically that is inside, say, that R matrix uh, radius. So within the inner region, this is what we do. When you go to the outer region, the problem is simpler, of course, and the wave functions can be expressed as a product of the residual um, ion and electron angular behavior wave functions, they the channel functions, and these reduced radial wave functions that I mentioned before. And these come from solving a simple set of differential equations where you have a one electron Hamiltonian and an interaction potential that contains the long range coupling between channels, the laser interaction with the residual ion and the laser interaction with the ionized electrons. So this is solved with a finite difference discretization. And what is important here is that the grid in which this is solved needs to be large to prevent reflections of the ionized wave function from the end point. So um, when you use Hukir more plus to generate the inputs for the RMT, you use most of the problems that are the same, but as I mentioned before, the data requires significantly more specifically because, as I mentioned, you need all of the pairs of transition dipoles, but also because, as I say, you need larger matrix ready um, because you need this grid overlap. Uh, in the RMT calculations, the time evolution is done by an Arnoldi method. Um, and something that we found with the tests and some of the calculations that I'm going to show you soon is that the quality of uh, the time independent results uh, that we get using the same, say, quantum chemistry model gives an upper limit to the quality of the time dependent results. So getting the UKRMO plus input right, the data right is quite important. So this software um, I mentioned before, the UKRMO calls tend to be uh, freely available and we release the software, both the UKRMO plus suite and the RMT. So the RMT code can be downloaded from GitLab. Um, and the UKRMO Plus suite we make available on Zenodo. So Zenodo is a web website for you, who, those of you who don't know it, where you can deposit data, codes, etc. And the advantage there we, is that we, you can publish different versions. So whenever we find a bug in the code, so we implement new functionality, we, we um, release new versions and every new version has a DOI associated to it like a paper. And what that means is that whenever people use the code, they can very clearly um, cite it by using the DOI and um, be specific about the versions of the code that they can use. So if you go to Zenodo and, try and type UKMO Plus, you will find the UKMO Plus suite, the inner and the outer regions, the codes are um, published separately, really separately, and the GTO bus library. Um, the codes include CMake files and a test suite, so I would say they're reasonably easy to, um, to install and run. Um, maybe, maybe not, depending how much experience you have. But I wanted to mention something else that we're doing at the moment. And there is a US-led initiative to make uh, atomic and molecular physics codes um, readily available to use by the partners with this initiative and also by the atomic and molecular physics community at large. So this is in a very early stages, but it's what it's called a gateway. And the idea with that is that is uh, there is a web interface where you can log in and there's a simplified way of producing input for the codes and a simplified way of extracting output. So at the moment, um, there are a number of codes that you can see there on the right and you will uh, see some usual suspects, XCHEM is there, um, in Quincy's codes are there, EPOL is cut, Bob Lucchese's code is there, some electron and positron scattering codes are there too. And um, so, and this is linked with some supercomputers in the United States, but there's no reason why it couldn't be linked to other computers or gateway cloned and linked to other computers. So this is in the very early stages, but we hope to make um, developments here and make sure that the codes that are being uh, developed by the community can be used more widely. So um, let me now try and move to some examples of calculations that we have done, and I will present both time independent and time dependent results. So this first result is one photon ionization of H2, and this is the asymmetry parameter. And what I wanted to show here is that when we perform the calculation for a single geometry, so for the equilibrium geometry of H2, we get an, asymm an asymmetry parameter 
uh, and the curve you need to look at here is the Cray curve, where you can see peaks that are associated to the resonances that are present in the system. Of course, in general, the experiments do not have the resolution to describe uh, those resonances. So if what we do is a vibration average of the asymmetry parameters, what we get is this reddish brown curve where the resonances are no longer visible and the agreement with the recent, most recent experiments is on the whole very, very good. So in the same way that we do one photoionization uh, calculations with the time independent code, uh, we can do two photon ionization with both the time independent and the time dependent codes. So here I'm showing you um, the two photon ionization of H2. And what we were doing here is trying to understand how, uh, what we needed to perform accurate calculations with the RMT codes. So what you will, what you see in the first fit picture here is a comparison of several types of calculations. So to generate the UKMO plus input, we use a bispline only continuum. We try two types of basis sets for the bound molecular orbitals, uh, augmented basis sets, a double zeta and a triple zeta. The calculation is equivalent to what would be a full, full CI. And these uh, uh, results that I'm showing you are the parallel polarization of the field, parallel to the molecular axis. So in this first figure, what you see is calculations. The full lines are UKMO plus time independent calculations. And the red one is with the double zeta basis and the blue one with the triple zeta basis. And you can see that the agreement is very good between the both of them for lower energies. But when you go to higher energies, the results start to uh, uh, differ, particularly in the proximity of this second resonance. Now, the RMT calculations with exactly the same input are here are plotted with empty and full dots. And you will see that the results are very close to the time independent ones, but they are not exactly on the curve. You can also see as dashed line some results from Morales et al, which I think are from Fernando Martin's group and um, the DFT based calculations. So the agreement of all of them is very good, but something that you would notice is the differences are largest where the resonance is. But the other point is that we realized that in this case, when you use the RMT code to achieve good agreement with the time independent results, you need very long pulse terms of turn pulse tunnel. So the, the blue dots for the triple seater bases, the empty ones are for a turn on of 30 cycles, and the full dots are for a turn on of 300 cycles. And you can see here, for example, how that point comes down here to basically full agreement with the time independent codes. Uh, and you can see that there is there are differences even at lower, smaller, but it differences at lower energies here too. So that's something that we learned that we needed that in the time in the time dependent codes. The other thing that we uh, noticed or discovered is that for the time independent calculations, we needed to make sure that the, the size of the R matrix box is important. We needed to make sure that the R matrix boxes were large enough. So the comparison is here with earlier calculations, and you can see the blue curve uh, results with um, an R matrix box of thirty uh, bore, and the green one is with 50 ball, and you can see how when we increase the radius to 50 ball, the agreement with the early results is actually excellent. So uh, some more results. These are not uh, calculations that I've been involved with. These are calculations from Olga Smirnova's group, and these are um, photoelectron angular distributions for NO2. So this work was done, I think, because then they went on to um, study um, the dynamics, this, you know, uh, at the conical intersection, the photoelectron spectroscopy, uh, the dynamics of the uh, conical intersection. And I'm sorry, I haven't got the reference there. So they were interested in studying um, the photoionization for a number of geometries. And here you see results for three different angles between the NO bond length. Um, and you can see the uh, photoelectron angle trend distributions here. This is a calculation that was done not with B splines, but using Gaussians only for the continuum, because in 2017 we did not have the B spline implementation uh, in, a, in a shape that it could be used for these cal the calculations. Now, what the, uh, the GBTO library allows you to do is to compile and run the course in quadruple precision. 
So the problem with using Gaussians for the description of the continuum is one of linear dependence. We work with fully orthogonal orbitals, and if you have to use a lot of Gaussians, uh, you start to run into problems of linear dependence. Those problems can be ameliorated, and in the cases that we've tried almost solve completely, if you move from running the constant double precision to particle precision. And that's something that this GBT only library allows you to do. Uh, we have done also, the codes have also been applied to bigger systems, to uh, substituted benzene molecules, for example, um, um, but using simple models. So let me show you another example for ionization of water. And again, this is another case where we have used the B spline only continuum. We can do it with the, for these um, three atom systems. And what you have here on the left is cross sections and on the right asymmetry parameters for ionization into specific states of the cation. So the ground state, the first excited state, and the second excited state. So in the case of the cross-sections, the results that I'm presenting are smooth. So we convolute the results to get rid of the very fine resonances that are not detected by the experiment, or that in some cases would not be there because of the vibrational motion. Um, and you can see that the agreement with prior experiments, with experiments, sorry, and prior calculations is um, very good. And on the right, you have the symmetry parameters. And here uh, we've plotted both the raw results from the Yokeamo plus code. So that's the gray curve where you can see all of the uh, spikes given by the resonances. And then these convoluted smooth results, which are again the red brown full curve. And again, agreement is very good here. And I wouldn't like to say whether it is any of the theoretical methods that actually provides a better description. The spread of experimental results, I think, doesn't allow us to say. So let me move now beyond what we can do perturbatively and move to strong field ionization of water. So here, what we wanted to do was to see if we could reproduce results from an earlier calculation, a single active electron calculation. Um, and therefore, we went for simpler models. So there are two types of models that we use. One is a single channel where we basically run a separate calculation for each of these three lowest um, states of the cation of H2O+. Plus. Uh, you see the results of this column. And then a couple model where all these three uh, um, channels are coupled. So on the left, you see the orbitals from which the electrons are ionized for each of the states. And here, what you see are the projections of the uh, ionization yields on the X, Y, Y, Z, and X, Z plane for these three states in the two models. This, again, was a bis plane only calculation. But here, the wave functions were not described as the CASA-CF level. They were described as the, at the Hartree-Fock level. So what we did is many calculations uh, for linearly polarized light from many orientations. And uh, I have no idea why that went back on its own. And um, with, um, with an intensity of 20 uh, terawatts. So what you can see here is that when we do the single channel calculation, the, the um, ionization yields have basically similar shapes to those of the orbitals from which the electron is ionized. And uh, therefore, what, what I'm trying to say is that the maximum of the ionization yield is consistent with the, the maximum of the electronic density of the orbit. However, when we couple the channels, what we see is that the ionization yields, all of them have basically the shape of that of the X state. OK, so what is happening here is that um, the state coupling, you know, both field and correlation related, basically redistributes the ionization yield of the lowest of the X state. The only exception is that in the case of the A state, some of the distribution that came from, you know, came from the shape of the A state is retained, as you can see here on the projection on the wide state plane. The other thing to notice is how the intensity, how the, sorry, how the size of the yields changes. So whereas the, the yields in the single channel case go from things that are of the order of 10 to the minus 6 to 10 to the minus 7 and 10 to the minus 10, the changes in the couple model are from 10 to the minus 6 to 10 to the minus 7 and then 10 to the minus 8. So um, to show you these results better, there is a comparison here. Now, basically, this picture that I plotted is the same plotted on the plane. And now we are comparing with a single um, active electron model. Um, and um, in, in looking at the paper, we realized that um, the, in the paper that was published is a fizz Reve paper. You had the reference in the previous slide. fizz Reve made a mistake. And instead of having dashed curves 
for the single channel model and full lines for the couple channel. The figure at the moment has full lines for all of the channels, so you cannot tell the difference. So I got in touch with Fizz Reve a day or two ago to ask them to correct the pitch. So again, what you can see here is that when you look at the dashed lines, and this dashed line here cannot be seen because it basically goes right under the SAE model, uh, for the dashed lines, in when you look at the same plane, the distributions are uh, different. You know, the maxima are of different uh, along different axes. So along um, x here and along z here. Um, but when you couple the channels, you can see that the distributions go more or less along the same axis. You can see it here, and you can also see it here with the green curve. Um, so I think um, I've. I've got to the end of my talk, and I hope I managed to show you that um, the R-matrix approach, both in the time and the time time independent, time dependent versions, uh, allows us to provide accurate descriptions of photoinization. Um, we've spent the last few years doing a lot of software development, and what we hope to do now is to do applications of it and exploit it to start, uh, study um, interesting physics. And when I say we, I just don't mean myself. I mean, as you will hear later on, Jakub, Jakub Benders, Danik Machine, um, our colleagues in Belfast, etc. So for the time-dependent calculations, I think we will have to stick to smallish molecules. Um, the time-dependent calculations, the empty calculations are quite demanding, and I think we're not perhaps yet at a state where we can really treat, treat, for example, biomolecules. We might need some further software development optimization to do this. And for the time-independent calculations, however, we think we can do bigger molecules and we can do some other things, and you will see Jakob's talk later today. And um, before I stop, I just wanted to remind people of something that's not related to my talk, or yes, in some way. Uh, many of you would have got an email from Fernando some months ago saying that the cost action is planning a special issue in computer physics communication on atosecond chemistry and physics software. So the guest editors are myself, Luca Genti uh, from Florida and Fernando Martin. And if you're interested, you may have got in touch with us already to let us know that you're interested, but if you're not, please do. And the idea is these are papers that describe software, so you need to have the paper and the software ready. And we plan for the deadline, submission deadline for this special issue to be around the autumn of next year. And um, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jimena. Uh, okay, so, are there any questions? While I'm waiting for people to sort of think of questions, Jimena, why exactly, what, can you just tell me briefly, so what actually is really the difference, the key difference between the R matrix method and the, 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 the sort of a B spline method that Fernando and Vincent and so on do? Because I thought that you divided the problem to the two parts, but your basis functions, especially with the B spline continuum, seem to do much the same now because they're covering the whole space. Yes. They do because you have, I mean, you have to, in a way, get cover the whole space. The main difference is that we use this trick of the R matrix, which is that we solve the problem in the inner region, then we build what is really called, I may even have a slide here, but we, what it is an R matrix, okay, which is something that allows us to, if you want, to match the inner region and the outer region solutions, okay? Mm -hmm. Or if you want, in another way, we use the inner region, you know, the inner region results to solve the differential equations in the outer region. So that, that is the difference, that we use this R matrix that is built you know, from the boundary amplitudes and the R matrix functions, and they don't. Okay, okay, okay. so it's just really the, the analysis of the problem that you're just using that part on the... The way, the, way in which you, the way in which you solve the problem, yes, in a way, in which you use the parts that you put into to solve the problem, yeah. Okay, okay, thank you, that makes sense. So we have questions, so Fernando? Yeah, uh, well, thank you very much, Jimena, for this very nice talk, uh, very complete. I have a question, uh, a curiosity. Uh, could you, could you uh, tell us uh, uh, an estimate of uh, what is the difference in computer time uh, between the two approaches you mentioned that uh, in which you only use uh, uh, B-splines uh, to describe the continuum and uh, you use B splines and, and monocentric Gaussians, uh, not for a diatomic, let's say for a regular molecule of, I don't know, a few atoms, five, six, you, you have the, just to, 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 to grasp yeah. if, uh, uh, how much uh, additional computational effort is needed. Okay, so we we'll do for, a, a all B spline calculation. For, for a big polyatomic molecule, um, say 
pyrazine, for example, the example okay. that Vincent was showing is that we haven't done these planes only. I think that would be too computationally demanding. That would be unwise at the moment, okay? Um, but for a triatomic molecule, um, the, di the, the difference, it depends on what basis you use to describe your bound orbitals, okay? But the difference could be ours. I'm not, I'm not gonna, you know, lie about this. The Gaussians, you know, the integrals, most of them are done analytically. Uh -huh. So, you know, you get high accuracy with little effort. With the beast planes, the integrals are done numerically. So you, to get the accuracy, you know, you need to put the time in. But in terms of, for example, if you're using RMT, if you're gonna do RMT calculations where you're, you know, the, that part of the problem is gonna take hours anyway, the additional cost, you know, is not a large percentage of the time that the whole calculation is going to take. And this is where we think, well, if we're going to spend a few hours calculating the integers, well, we're going to spend a few days perhaps doing all of the RMT calculations, so what does it matter? Really? So that's the thing. But yes, I mean, the, the, the difference is significant. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And there's a question from Jesus. Sorry, just a curiosity. When you use the TTT of leaf, uh, that is very, very nice. Uh, how is the behavior with the contractions? No, because in general, there are like two methods to do the integrals. Ones are like more based in non-contracted uh, integrals and the other ones like, for example, Molcas in the C1 and also Molpro now, they have more contracted uh, base uh, integrals. And the GTO leaf is gonna be more like, more contracted or less contracted, let's say. I'm not sure I understand your question, Jesus, sorry. <laughs> so there are like, a, like two types of algorithms to do these integrals, no? One is first I do the contractions. Uh, you mean the contractions, of the, the contractions of the Gaussians? Yes, the contractions of the Gaussians, because this can be very expensive, depending on the, the basis. So do you have it optimized for, con for contracted basis or not? <laughs> I will confess, I don't know. I would have to go and have a look. Come and come and come and find me at the mid the speaker. Okay. Uh, Zdenek will probably be there as well, who has knows all of the details of the code, and we'll discuss this. Okay. Okay. okay thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. So, just a quick question before we move on, and this is uh, from Zdenek. Uh, sorry. Well, I was I was just raising my hand, perhaps to just uh, answer Jesus, but we can leave it okay. for later. Is, is it a quick answer? Uh, yes, we do optimize for contractions, and I can provide some details. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You may you may also meet later and discuss more in detail. I'm sure the three of you. Okay. So thank you, Jimena. Uh, and we shall now move on. So our next speaker is Alex Kulev. Yeah. Let me share my screen. So Alex Kulas from Heidelberg, and he's going to be telling us about ultrafast non adiabatic dynamics in molecules following ionization. Wait, this was okay. okay perfect. See the presentation and not to the next slide. <laughs> I can see the, yes, exactly. And I can see your okay. mouse and everything. So over to you, Alex. Okay, let me uh, just put uh, probably a pointer just to see it better. Okay, of course, uh, first, thanks to uh, the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present our work. And uh, of course, many thanks for setting up uh, such a wonderful program. There was uh, very many exciting talks that uh, I was able to, to listen to. Um, <clears throat> you know, what I would uh, like to present is what we did, uh, let's say recently, and something which uh, of course we do for already uh, quite a while, is what is the dynamics in the molecule after uh, we uh, ionize it. So, in order to study the dynamics in uh, molecules, uh, it, of course, what we have to do, let's start from the beginning, we have to solve the molecular uh, time-dependent Schrodinger equation. This is, of course, what I will concentrate here is I will exclude the process of ionization. So uh, something what uh, Jimena uh, talked before me, and uh, this is, of course, as, as we saw and as we know, uh, uh, science by itself in a huge field, it's a very complicated problem. So this not only will complicate our, uh, our task to describe the dynamics after the ionization, but it will also put us in a, uh, uh, in a different, let's say, physical uh, uh, setting. We will not be so much interested in the way of producing uh, the uh, uh, ionic states or the, uh, the, the initial state of the system. We were more interested in how this uh, uh, the system will evolve afterwards. So it's uh, in a sense, it's not uh, 
so important for us, whether we do the ionization by a laser, by uh, scattering an electrons, positrons, or whatever. We just want to populate certain number of electronic states, as we saw, so to create an electronic coherence and to see how this the system will evolve uh, in time afterwards. So in principle, the, the Hamiltonian that will sit here, I put just uh, the molecular Hamiltonian, but of course this can include also uh, an interaction with the field if we want to add uh, a field and to uh, uh, study how the field uh, then uh, can uh, modulate the system or uh, let's say doing the probe uh, pulse and so on. So uh, all the methods that uh, I will present will uh, be also applicable if we include a time dependent part of this Hamiltonian. Now, the problem is that, of course, we cannot solve this equation. Yeah, as we all know, it's too complex uh, if we go beyond uh, two particles, so we cannot uh, do this in its full complexity, and we usually need some sort of approximations. Now, the, the approximations that we, we somehow tend to always try to do is to keep, because of the huge success and uh, of the von Oppenheimer approximation, we always tend to separate our problem into an electronic and a nuclear problem. So to separate our full molecular wave function, which depends on all coordinates of electrons and nuclei, into something which, uh, let's say, we can try to do the electron dynamics in the fixed nuclei, which we did a lot in the past. Or we can, of course, uh, do nuclear dynamics on potential energy surfaces. So uh, the, the electronic states, the notion of electronic states, of course, also come from the bonn oppenheimer approximation. So this is, let's say, in the framework within which we want to, uh, to keep somehow and to, uh, to analyze our results. So the, the main question is how we can merge those two, how we can, on one hand, have uh, 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 described well the electron dynamics and uh, see what the electrons are doing, and on the other hand, uh, uh, have the, uh, the description also on the nuclear dynamics, which will set in at some point, and of course, not losing uh, this nice uh, idea of separating the electrons and uh, the nuclei. So before showing how we can uh, do that, let me just discuss two important points in, uh, in describing uh, the, uh, the uh, dynamics in ions. One is the electron correlation. Yeah? Even if even at fixed nuclei, this is extremely important, and this one can see if one tries to describe the, uh, or to get the ionization channels or the uh, ionic states, cationic states within an independent particle model. So being this uh, hartree fock or DFT or so on, the only way to describe the ionization states in a system is by applying somehow to remove electrons from particular orbitals. So what we will get when we do that is of course some states, which will be lines here, we have fixed uh, nuclei, where each state corresponds to the, the system with one electron less in a particular orbital where the, orb the different colors represent, of course, different orbitals. So this in, let's say, uh, second quantization language, this will be something we apply some annihilation operator on a single Slater determinant yeah, of some orbitals. Now, of course, this is known already for for a long time, that the, the situation is actually quite more complicated when we include the electron correlation. When we include the electron correlation, not only that these states will move and will shift uh, uh, because of accounting for the electron correlation, we'll have additional effects which we'll won't be, we won't be able to describe within a single electron uh, or uh, independent particle uh, model. So we'll have, due to the correlation, we can have, let's say, mixing of this one whole correlation, so uh, of one co configurations. So uh, electrons missing in different orbitals can couple and form uh, ionic states, or we can have things which are completely impossible to describe within uh, one particle uh, picture. These are like satellites states, so additional states which appear due to let's say excitations that we can trigger into our systems, like what is shown here, or a complete breakdown of the molecular orbital picture. This means that removing an electron from let's say an inner valence orbital, instead of populating a single ionic state will actually populate a large multitude of uh, ionic states. 
And we know that this implicitly means that we trigger electron dynamics, so populating many uh, ionic states, will, so we create an electronic wave packet. So including the electron correlation gives us first a way to, to, to construct or to, to create a, a, an electronic wave packet uh, completely naturally uh, in, in contrast to the way we can construct electronic wave packets in the independent particle uh, model approaches where we implicitly has to or explicitly has to couple more than one uh, orbital in, uh, uh, in our consideration. Here we can do exactly the same. We can, of course, couple many, many orbitals, but or ionization from many orbitals, but the electronic correlation will give us something additionally, additional, which is uh, we, we won't be able to describe with an independent particle model. So electronic correlation is important, and this is uh, something that we need to keep to, uh, to account. Now let's see what the, the non-adiabatic dynamics, or so the, the dynamics, the moving of the nuclei can uh, give us. Of course, as I said, Bonoppenheimer is something which is yeah, the, uh, the other, in a sense, important, um, or the milestone in, uh, in uh, quantum chemistry. Uh, the, the question is that the Bonoppenheimer approximation is, of course, defined on a single potential energy surface. So uh, we, we don't couple different potential energy surfaces. As we said, if we want to trigger electron dynamics, we, this means that we have to populate several electronic states. And if we populate these states which are not coupled uh, among themselves, so we got something uh, rather trivial as a nuclear dynamics. So uh, the wave packets will run on these uh, potential energy surfaces uh, completely independently. Um, uh, so we need to include, of course, non-adiabatic effects. And there are two regimes. I will cover both of them. Uh, we'll give you examples from both of them. One is when we have in the outer valence, when we couple uh, just a few uh, states, we, we have uh, less dense spectrum in the uh, outer valence. So here, of course, the things are, uh, uh, of course, more involved than in uh, the case of uh, non-coupling states. So we can transfer, of course, already populations. So we have, in addition to uh, the electron coherences that we create, we can also destroy these coherences by moving the, uh, the nuclear wave packets on these potential curves, and also by transferring population from one state to another through uh, non-adiabatic effects. Now, what I would like to cover also is uh, something which uh, uh, we have in the inner valence regime where we saw even removing an electron from a single orbital can populate a large amount of uh, uh, ionic state. So we get some sort of a salad like that, which is of course, uh, with uh, many, many uh, conical intersection uh, in between, and it gives rise to a very complicated dynamics but uh, we will uh, see that we also can uh, attack and how we can attack uh, this problem. Okay, let me briefly present you the, the way we, uh, we did uh, this uh, recently in a, in a couple of examples. So as I said, we want to, to stay within uh, the idea of uh, having elect electrons and nuclei somehow separated for uh, interpretational also reasons. So what we, uh, we start with is in principle exact on one expansion. Uh, so we, we use our electronic states or cationic uh, states as a basis, which they form a full basis. And we have this expansion coefficients uh, in front, which are of course our nuclear wave packets, which run on uh, these potential surfaces. So the, the time dependence is only in uh, the, uh, the nuclear wave packets. Now, of course, the, uh, the electronic states are solutions of our electronic uh, Schrodinger equation. And as I said, uh, this, uh, the better uh, approximation we do here, including the electron correlations, the better, because we have a better description of uh, this part. So the, in a sense, the first step in, in, uh, uh, in this scheme is to construct our potential energy uh, surfaces. Unfortunately, of course, when we do this, we are implicitly uh, within the adiabatic uh, representation. So as we all know, when we do this, uh, um, then the, the, uh, Schrodinger, the time dependent Schrodinger equation for the nuclear wave packets uh, starts to look a bit uh, nasty. So we have uh, a non-adiabatic coupling elements coming from, uh, of course, action of the 
nuclear kinetic energy on the electronic uh, state. So we have our derivative couplings, which is quite uh, uh, difficult to, to compute. And what one usually uh, needs is to go to, uh, to do some sort of diabetization, to go to another representation in the electronic space, diabetize the electronic uh, space such that we move in a sense the derivative couplings. Of, so we move from a derivative couplings to uh, potential couplings uh, within uh, the matrix uh, W here. So the, the, the transfer of population is done not uh, by uh, gradients uh, on the electronic surfaces, but uh, by a simple potential uh, matrix. Of course, the diabetization is also uh, a huge field by itself. Uh, uh, what we used and in the, uh, the examples that I will show, these are, is the vibronic coupling uh, method, which works extremely well for, let's say, a situation when uh, we don't have uh, large amplitude motion. So uh, when the system doesn't change much uh, uh, in, uh, uh, after uh, the ionization. These will be the examples that I will uh, discuss. So the, the vibronic coupling uh, Newtonian method was uh, also developed a long time ago and applied extremely successfully by many, many people, including, of course, uh, our chairman today. Um, so in, in a nutshell, this is a Taylor expansion of uh, um, the potentials. And uh, we can we include different uh, terms in also coupling uh, terms here. And the idea is that when we diagonalize our uh, vibronic uh, coupling uh, potential matrix, we have to recover the adiabatic potentials that we have uh, constructed uh, through um, some sort of electronic structure methods. So these uh, parameters here in front of the different terms are something that we, uh, we need to fit and to, to find the best fit of uh, so the step number two in the, in the uh, process is to construct the vibronic coupling Hamiltonian. And with the vibronic coupling Hamiltonian, then we, need, we can propagate uh, the, our initial state. So as I mentioned, the initial state here, because we want to, to have also electron dynamics, is uh, uh, different from uh, what traditionally is done when one is uh, using uh, or one is interested only in the nuclear dynamics in, uh, within uh, um, excited systems or in the photodynamics uh, or the photochemistry, usually where a single uh, vibrational uh, wave packet is propagated on uh, many uh, electronic states. Here we have to start, so our initial state is a superposition of many electronic, uh, uh, of many uh, states. So we have several or many uh, uh, vibrational wave packets which are running on uh, this uh, coupled multidimensional potential energy surfaces. So we have to propagate or to solve uh, the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. And uh, since, of course, we are in Heidelberg, uh, what we use is uh, the MCTDH. I won't present anything from the MCTDH. I uh, expected that uh, Fabian will do this on the first day, but it was uh, mentioned already by Luik. Uh, so uh, for those who are not familiar with the MCTDH, they or who are not familiar, they have already some idea. It's a way of uh, solving uh, the multidimensional coupled uh, problem or propagating uh, wave packets on, uh, on uh, coupled multidimensional surfaces. So uh, let me discuss the last point in uh, what we, uh, we need to, to, to do in order to visualize at the end what we are doing or to analyze our results. Traditionally, what we always uh, did when we were uh, doing um, electron dynamics on fixed nuclei was to, uh, to use the density ele electron density operator or whole density in uh, this case, it's, it's time evolution. Here, the things are a bit more complicated. We need to integrate, uh, of course, not only on the electronic degrees of freedom, but also on the nuclear degrees of freedom. Um, so if we first integrate on the N minus one electron uh, degrees of freedom, we will get uh, 
our density matrix, which will depend also on uh, the nuclear coordinate. The question is that within the adiabatic uh, basis, so if we use the, the, the diabatic uh, uh, states, the, uh, our density matrix will be very little, yeah, in principle, dependent on the, on the nuclear positions, on the momentary nuclear positions. So um, within the diabatic basis, we can uh, assume that uh, the density uh, is, doesn't change much with changing the nuclear position. So we can take uh, this uh, quantity out. And uh, then what we will have at the end will be a density where all the time dependence actually will come from the overlap of the different vibrational wave packets running on the different uh, uh, coupled electronic uh, potential energy surfaces. Um, and uh, the, the computation of the uh, electronic density can be done uh, uh, like always, like usual. Now, let me show you uh, two examples. First is, uh, something that we did on, uh, on propiolic acid and when we studied the charge migration in propiolic acid. So this is the outer valence uh, spectrum of the propiolic acid uh, molecule computed by uh, yeah, ADC and screens function calculation uh, at uh, equilibrium distance. So what we see here is uh, that we have uh, this whole mixing that I was uh, mentioning at the beginning between the HOMO and in principle the HOMO minus two yeah, they, they, these uh, the third and the fourth states are from different symmetries, so in principle they can be addressed uh, differently. So what happens if we let's say ionize the homo, which is more or less localized on the, this carbon carbon triple bond, we will induce these pure electronic oscillations uh, between the uh, carbon triple bond and the carbonyl oxygen uh, here. So uh, this is what you see here. So it fixed. Nuclei, this of course oscillation will uh, last forever and will go back and forth between the two ends of uh, the molecule. The question is how this changes and how this dephases when we include the, the nuclear dynamics. This was a large uh, or a debate, or still a debate in, uh, in, the, in the community, how fast this decoherence from the nuclear motion uh, takes place. So, um, if we want to uh, do this, we, we took all the 15 uh, normal modes or the 15 uh, nuclear degrees of freedom of the system. We constructed uh, the vibronic coupling Hamiltonian over all these uh, modes. So this is just one uh, shown here, just to see how uh, uh, the, the vibronic coupling Hamiltonian works. So the dots are, of course, um, the adiabatic, uh, energies uh, and the full lines are coming from uh, the diagonalization of our vibronic coupling Hamiltonian. Then uh, we have constructed uh, the initial wave packet. So uh, this is, as you see, we need to uh, populate uh, in a sense two uh, states. They are populated such that uh, they reflect the removal of the homo electron uh, from, from the system. What is shown here is uh, this uh, whole mixing uh, parameter, as you see, uh, at different geometries. Of course, these two orbitals mix uh, differently, so this has to be taken into account. Of course, we have a large um, um, mixing, so uh, like at uh, position minus uh, point uh, minus two in this uh, mass weighted. Uh, uh, coordinates and the equilibrium, uh, we have uh, this, as you see, something like. Uh, um, 70 to uh, 30 percent uh, mixing in uh, the two. So uh, this is in this particular mode. Of course, uh, we have this in uh, all modes. So we construct the uh, initial state and we propagate it. Uh, so now what uh, you see here is, uh, as I mentioned, the um, the overlap between uh, the the wave packets. Uh, so what I have shown here are the important ones. Of course. Uh, up there is the population, so uh, we don't have strong non-adiabatic couplings here between the states, so there's very little uh, transfer population due to the non-adiabatic effects. 
But what is uh, important here is uh, how the coherence uh, is kept. This is, in a sense, uh, the, uh, the off-diagonal elements uh, in the overlap of the, the wave packets give uh, the coherence between the, uh, the two um, states. So we see that we keep uh, the coherence uh, for about 10, 15 uh, femtoseconds. This is the full. Uh, as I uh, show you how the, um, the density or the electron, the whole density of the system, we start with something which is localized on the triple bond and it, this is the way how it dephases. It makes a few oscillations before it gets um, uh, defaced and uh, distributed along uh, uh, the molecule. Now, uh, in um, this can be, this is something that we did recently. I wanted to show you also uh, the theory behind, but uh, if you are interested, you can uh, look in this paper, which is still in the archive, um, still in the archive only. <laughs> um, this is a way to, to uh, see this type of oscillations or the, the charge uh, migration, uh, possible ways to do up to second transient absorption. Here, with, uh, with including the, the nuclear dynamics, so what one can use is uh, uh, excitation from either from the carbons, or one S of the two carbons on the triple bond, or from the two oxygens. So this is, these are the ionic states uh, corresponding to the removal of these core electrons. And we uh, drive, of course, transitions between uh, either the carbons uh, KH or the uh, oxygen KH to, um, to the valence uh, uh, ionic states. And this is the trace that one would uh, get depending on from where uh, one uh, sites. These are already uh, pulses exist in, let's say, the carbon H. The oxygen is uh, still barely covered, but uh, this is uh, uh, already coming. And what we did here is, of course, a full averaging over uh, all possible orientations. If we orient, then we can, of course, also pinpoint where the initial hole is created and uh, what is exactly the motion between the two. Now, in the last uh, few minutes, I will just briefly present uh, something that I promised from the beginning to see what and how one can do uh, um, this regime where we have uh, many, many uh, um, electronic states and we have uh, some sort of uh, like spaghetti of uh, curves here, which are of course many, many uh, conical intersections. So this is something that we did in Naftalen uh, because of the uh, nice experiments uh, that Frank Lepin uh, performed in uh, Lyon. So these are time resolved photoelectron uh, spectroscopy experiments. What in short, what they do is uh, they ionize the system by uh, uh, short uh, XUV pulse uh, with the spectrum uh, that is uh, shown here. This is the ionization spectrum computed by ionization spectrum of naphthalene. And then they come with a weak infrared pulse, which can further ionize the system. This is the double ionization threshold uh, of the naphthalene here. So the weak uh, infrared pulse can further ionize uh, the system. And these are the electrons which they uh, collect and uh, then see how they evolve depending on the delay between the pump and the probe. So what they see is that actually going closer or ionizing closer to the double ionization uh, threshold, actually this relaxation of the population so the, the, the system can relax and uh, going down. Uh, energetically becomes slower and slower. So this is uh, yeah, a bit uh, massaged data that I uh, showed you. It corresponds to uh, mainly ionization of three uh, orbitals. So these are groups of states that one forms by ionizing these orbitals. This is a zoom of the spectrum. This is what we uh, uh, get here. These are the orbitals and um, in principle, we see that uh, yeah, the ionization, let's say, from these groups of states uh, relaxes slower than the ionization of these groups of states. So when we did this dynamic, so we, we did the vibronic coupling Hamiltonian, we include 23 states and 25 modes uh, of the system. 
And when we did the propagation, we were a bit surprised that what we got is that uh, this, if we look in the population of the main states here, in these groups of states, we see an extremely fast uh, uh, um, relaxation or the population of the states much, much faster than what is observed experimentally. And not only this, they are in a completely different order. So what we see is, let's say that uh, these states, uh, these states, uh, um, depopulates or relaxes much, much faster or faster than uh, the, uh, the green state. Yeah? So this is um, uh, something that uh, struck us at the beginning. And then we realized it's the, um, the coupling here between the non-adiabatic coupling between these very, very dense uh, states is actually uh, such that it's already meaningless to uh, to think about individual electronic states and and transfer of population between individual electronic states. So uh, one needs to, to think about like bands. So these are bands of uh, states, so they're so dense that one form like a band in, in a solid. Uh, and uh, if we look at the population or uh, uh, population transfer in a group of states, which more or less corresponds uh, to what are the um, uh, first, the, uh, the resolution in the experiment, uh, and second, the way one can extract this uh, um, the population or relaxation time scale, we get something which is uh, certainly uh, it's not uh, exactly at top of the experiment, but uh, uh, at least gives everything in the right, uh, right order. So what we see is that indeed going up in energy or closer to the double ionization uh, threshold these states start to relax uh, slower than uh, states which are lying uh, below. And um, it can be, uh, so it's quite different from, let's say, the low energy uh, regime where we have few states and typically a few uh, conical intersections. Uh, I'm finishing, yeah? <laughs> I see that you're already nervous. This is the last slide that I will show. Uh, so here going in the low energy regime, going up in uh, uh, energy, the states indeed starts to relax faster. So this is the typical situation that we get. And in the uh, high energy uh, or close to already double ionization threshold, we start forming these correlation bands. And in a sense, the wave packets have to go through so many conical intersection in their intersections in their relaxation down that in a sense, they got stuck into uh, the correlation band. So correlation band is not something that we discovered. There's, they, 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 there's a long uh, history in uh, how they, they are formed and, um, and um, uh, what they do. What we uh, recently did is to uh, actually show that this is uh, not specific for naphthalene or, yeah, so this is, uh, an extremely important uh, way of relaxation in uh, uh, in uh, many electron systems. So this is what we uh, recently published. Okay, I will briefly just say a few words in conclusion. So we can do fully quantum uh, coupled electron nuclear dynamics following coionization. Yeah, this can be done with uh, a combination of uh, what we do, of course, is ADC or Green's function, vibronic coupling against the H. Uh, we can, one can do both inner and outer valence with the uh, inner valence, as I said, it's uh, one uh, needs to consider the correlation bands. Uh, long lived coherence are not completely excluded. So the question, the, the, the system not always decohere extremely fast. And uh, the, the dynamics in the correlation band can be uh, extremely interesting and important. And I will leave the acknowledgements. Uh, yeah, of course, the, the people in yellow are more important for the work uh, than the others, but uh, yeah, and some financial support. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Yeah, indeed. Started to get a bit nervous with the timing, but it's okay. I yeah, I, 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 I realized that I was a bit modest when I asked only for 30 minutes, then of course they are never enough, I said. Yeah, yeah. trouble was I was finding it interesting, so I didn't want to stop you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so does anyone have any 
questions for Alex. Fernando. Uh, very nice talk, uh, Alex. Uh, I Thank have. I would. I would like to know your opinion about the following. Uh, as you know, uh, well, first, uh, doing full quantum mechanical both for electrons and nuclei is the, absolutely the uh, the right way to do it. Now, but as you know, in many experiments, uh, they what they measure is ions. So they detect ions that come after fragmentation of the molecule when you ionize it. And from the uh, yields they, they measure for these ions, they try to get information about the early electron dynamics. So I was wondering if with uh, the approach, the MCTDH approach you are using, it would be realistic to describe the nuclear dynamics until you know the dissociation of the <coughs> ion is produced and uh, how realistic this would be. Yes, <laughs> in, in, in principle, it is, of course, uh, MCTDH can, can deal with uh, such kind of problems. Here, here, the problematic part is, of course, the vibronic coupling, uh, Hamiltonian, or how you describe the, 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 uh, the potential. So if you, if you do a normal diabetization of your states, because I, I think the diabetization in this case is important, um, uh, then then you can, of course, uh, do also fragmentation. So you will have, let's say, channel, which will lead you to a fragmentation. MCDH allows you to put uh, complex absorbing potential, so you can get also fragments and uh, so on. So th 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 this, is, this won't be a problem. The problematic part here will be the diabetization of the potential energy surfaces that uh, one needs to do. In principle, in, in, in such, uh, if we are talking about uh, larger molecules, what we call large, of course, uh, molecules then uh, uh, doing full dynamics is uh, relatively complicated, of course. Uh, so in this case, one should, be, should probably go to some reduced dimensionality, at least capturing the few, let's say the, the uh, dissociation channel we are interested in, plus a few, let's say, degrees of freedom, which will be uh, important for, for the dynamics, and then do full potential surfaces, not like us now cuts uh, with, within vibrational modes. This, of course, is possible to, to describe, let's say, the dephasing due to the nuclear dynamics, but, of course, not uh, uh, if we want to do the dissociation, as you said. But in principle, it's possible. One can go there methods for doing diabetization and into full dynamics on the potential surfaces. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Sonia? Yes, um, you mentioned ADC. Can you uh, clarify which level of ADC you use? Yeah, it's ADC3 what we do, yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. It is, uh, we, we take into account all uh, two-hole, one-particle configuration. So everything in the two-hole, one-particle is covered. Thank you. You're welcome. Is your question very quick, Gilbert? Yes. Yeah, it is. Um, so I'm. So I would have just have want to ask a question about the uh, numerical effort or the computational effort that you had, for instance, with naphthalene. So when you did this 25 normal modes and I think also 23 states, yeah. Yeah. Uh, to tell you the truth, is it's it's not much. The the the, the um, uh, so it was m more effort was to let's say to to construct the potential energy surfaces or to run the ADC calculations. This was more effort than doing the propagation afterwards. Uh, the um, the many modes these are cuts, yeah. So these are not full potential. So we don't need a huge amount of space in order to store the uh, also. Uh, the, the wave function. So um, it, it is something that uh, one, I mean, it's not, let's say, weeks of calculation. This is what I mean. The, the, the preparation and the constructing of the vibronic coupling Hamiltonian takes, of course, uh, time. Uh, but then the propagation, for example, by the MCDH is relatively fast. Uh, one, one can do within hours. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so thank you, Alex. Um, and we better Thank move you. on. So our next speaker is Kathleen Kovacs. Okay, thank you very much. Now I uh, share the screen. Uh, is it okay? Can you hear me? 
can hear you fine. Yes. Okay. Then uh, also you see me now, yes. isn't it? Uh, the title of my talk is Macroscopic Modeling of Attosecond Pass Generation. And I would like to say that our work situates somewhere between working group one and working group two, in the sense that we try to support experimental groups by modeling and simulation, as I will show during the presentation. Um, uh, first, uh, I give a short reminder about high harmonic generation. Then I give a motivation why macroscopic modeling is necessary. Uh, the three-dimensional non-adiabatic model, which I will present, follows the natural sequences of the high harmonic generation. So, therefore, I will present the problems related to the propagation of ultra-short pulses, um, the changes, the temporal and the spatial changes uh, of the medium's re uh, effective refractive index, uh, I will uh, present uh, briefly the elemental laser atom interaction uh, and uh, a little bit about uh, the cases when multiple ionization takes place due to very strong, very intense laser pulses. And I also present a case study uh, in this sense. Then uh, we also present the way how we calculate the macroscopic buildup of attosecond pulses with special attention to the time dependent phase matching analysis. And uh, finally, in order to highlight how important these macroscopic propagation effects are, I will present two uh, case studies, two representative cases based on, on uh, experiments. High harmonic generation in gas medium takes place like this, an intense femtosecond laser pass is focused into a gas jet or a static cell. Uh, here, the elementary interaction between the laser and the atom takes place. Then the generated XUV high harmonics propagate first um, in the same medium together with the driver. Then the XUVs can be refocused or dispersed uh, depending on the experimental conditions. And then finally, uh, hopefully, we, we obtain the measured high harmonic power spectrum. Now, at the basic level, at the atomic level, we uh, know very well the three-step uh, three model. Uh, first, the strong uh, laser pass distorts the atomic uh, Coulomb potential. and uh, one electron can tunnel ionize. And here I would like to uh, say to keep in mind that exactly due to this case, the basis of this phenomenon is ioniz ionization. So we must take into account always in the modeling the ground state depletion. Then the free electron is accelerated and in the next half cycle uh, it uh, uh, might come back and recombine and emit the energetic high harmonic photon. Now, due to the fact that this process takes place twice during one optical cycle, the typical high harmonic spectrum in, spectr in the spectral representation is uh, um, the odd, odd order harmonics of the fundamental pulse, and uh, temporarily these are uh, attosecond bursts, attosecond pulses, a train of attosecond pulses separated by uh, half of the laser period. Now, why is it important to uh, take into to account the macroscopic um, effects during modeling? Uh, because the driver always suffers serious distortions during pro propagation, just as you see here, uh, for example, this uh, uh, input laser pass, the black one, uh, after short propagation in the gas medium, uh, accumulates a cell phase modulation and both a decrease in the intensity. And then these two pulses, uh, basically uh, result or generate completely different uh, dipole spectra. The black uh, uh, spectrum corresponds to, to uh, the dipole spectra spectrum of the initial pass, and the red one uh, has a, a lower cutoff, 
due to uh, the, the decrease in the intensity. And also what you cannot see, but if we zoom in, we can see that also the, the individual harmonics, the red ones are blue shifted due to the surface modulation of the fundamental pulse. So we always have to include propagation effects. And this is not science fiction, this is almost exactly the beam line, uh, one of the beam lines at Eli Alps. Um, therefore, uh, I motivate that uh, the purpose of the modeling uh, is to faithfully reproduce as faithfully as possible the experimental conditions. And for this purpose, our model uses uh, as input parameters almost always experimentally measurable quantities like uh, like uh, pulse energy, pulse duration, central wavelength, waste. Uh, we try to account as uh, exactly as possible for the focusing, for the clipping uh, of uh, the fundamental beam, for the uh, geometry of the whole system to include the gas properties, uh, what kind of gas, what's a pressure if there is a pressure distribution um, and somehow to make a trade-off between uh, accuracy and computational time but uh, really never uh, we always favor accuracy that, that's what i i wanted to say uh, the structure of this model follows uh, the physical phenomena uh, we first construct the input case, the input pass, initial pass based on experimental uh, data or information. Then we solve the propagation of the uh, fundamental pass, solve the single dipole um, response in the laser atom interaction, and then uh, propagate the harmonics and try to see the conditions for uh, a good build-up, a coherent build-up of the final high harmonic radiation. These uh, models are based on the seminal paper of uh, Priori, but uh, um, further developed to account for or to capture uh, as many uh, experimental conditions as possible. So then first the propagation of the uh, ultra-short laser pulses, this is not a um, if a first big uh, part of the modeling and not trivial at all. First, we construct the initial pass. I will uh, uh, show it immediately also with uh, uh, formulae. Um, these can be Gaussian beams or truncated or Bessel beam if it comes uh, from from a, 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 a compressor. Then. Um, we um, solve the wave equation in, uh, we write the wave equation in time domain, but then we solve it in frequency domain and in cylindrical coordinates because we assume a cylindrical symmetry of the, uh, for the whole system uh, and solve the equation self consistently. But what I want uh, to highlight here is that the non adiabacity of the model comes from the fact that in each spatial step, the new, the modified, the distorted electric field is calculated. And so it is uh, also the effective refractive index updated uh, during um, propagation. So how we construct the initial field. Now here I, I just show a Gaussian pass, but it can be uh, uh, not necessarily Gaussian. It has a, a spatial envelope, it has a temporal envelope, and in the phase part, it, contains, it accounts for the spatial phase, and it accounts also for the CEPs, for the chirp, whatever is needed. Um, it uh, uh, can be, can, this uh, input pass can be everything, including uh, uh, data coming from uh, uh, spectral intensity and phase uh, measurements, so as real as possible. Uh, this is the propagation equation. We know it uh, very well, but what is interesting is that uh, the source term itself is the unknown field. So this is an explicit dependence uh, on the unknown uh, fundamental electric field, but also the effective refractive index um, 
accounts for uh, uh, many things, accounts for the dispersion on the neutrals, the linear dispersion, accounts for the uh, uh, curve effect, the nonlinear uh, curve effect, which is again an implicit dependence on the unknown field, and uh, most importantly accounts for the plasma term through the free electron density, which again uh, depends implicitly on the unknown, sh on the shape of the unknown field through uh, the um, free electron density in the medium. Finally, after all the transformations, this is uh, uh, the analytical form of the equation we solve using a self-consistent iterative method, uh, uh, which is uh, one big part of uh, modeling and uh, uh, again in each step the field and the refractive index are updated according to the uh, uh, instantaneous situation. Let me uh, a little bit demonstrate or show which term in the effective refractive index is uh, uh, more important. Uh, if we uh, here uh, we see the evolution of the peak intensity of a pulse as it propagates through a medium. This is, uh, these are, uh, I don't uh, insist on the uh, actual parameters, but this is a very usual set of parameters, a very uh, everyday pulse nowadays. And if we switch on and off successively uh, different um, terms in the refractive index, we can see that uh, uh, if uh, we turn on, turn off, uh, for example, the plasma term, uh, then the evolution of the peak intensity of the pulse barely changes, it's almost like the vacuum case. So uh, we can conclude that in most cases, uh, the plasma term is by far most uh, uh, important contribution. Uh, the laser atom interaction at dipole level uh, uses in our uh, model uses the strong field approximation. We make sure to be within this approximation. Um, the nonlinear non dipole response is calculated with the Levenstein integral, which we know uh, the physical meaning is that uh, here is the ionization uh, uh, transition matrix element. Uh, this is the phase accumulated uh, by the electron during its excursion. We um, calculate it using saddle point approximation, the matrix element for the recombination. Um, but uh, always we, we take into account uh, the ionization um, for the macroscopic nonlinear response, which is a non-trivial task. And I will not very much insist on this because we heard nice presentations during this conference uh, treating this non-trivial problem of ionization. And we also, as a consequence of uh, the ionization, we always take into account the ground state depletion when we calculate the macroscopic nonlinear response of uh, the atom. Just a few words about the used ionization models. These we use basically the ADK model, but um, depending on the atomic species, depending on the intensity regime, we usually apply corrections based on calculations and experimental data. Um, as uh, I just indicated, uh, several papers we uh, uh, base ourselves on, uh, but uh, uh, depending on the problem itself, we can uh, adjust uh, uh, the ionization model. What is important here is that always we calculate the ionization rates for an instantaneous electric field. Uh, as uh, lasers uh, are stronger and stronger, uh, the multiple ionization of atoms uh, comes uh, becomes a real problem and has to be solved. Now we implemented uh, a successive multiple ionization model based on this paper of uh, Gonzalez. And uh, we uh, solve a set of rate equ equations for uh, the sequential the successive ionization and the depletion of uh, um, the population of different ionic states. And finally, we can um, 
uh, obtain the total free electron density, which is a very important quantity, as you uh, saw in earlier slides for uh, the nonlinear response. Let me show a case study for this uh, 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 multiple ionization case. Um, we constructed a pulse uh, which uh, reaches around uh, 10 to the 16 watt per square centimeter intensity at the cell entrance and it can cause uh, and it, it enters into an argon medium and uh, it can cause ionization of uh, up to argon 6 plus and here I show how uh, during during the rising part of the laser pulse this is its uh, envelope a different species of different charges uh, born to say like this so their popul population increases and their uh, population decreases and depletes due to further ionization again up to argon six plus and this is how uh, the laser pass its temporal shape of the input of the generating laser pass distorts and modifies uh, during uh, propagation and we can also uh, see here uh, uh, bigger steps in ionization this is uh, these are the time moments during uh, a pass evolution when uh, the new species uh, the new the higher charge ionic species starts to dominate let us uh, look a little bit uh, in uh, space domain, in spatial domain. This is how the spatial map of the ionization degree looks like uh, just after the pulse has uh, gone. Uh, you can see these uh, uh, regions in the spatial domain where uh, uh, different uh, charges of uh, ionic different uh, ionic species dominate. Uh, and this causes a very serious distortion of, uh, of the laser pass. This is how its uh, peak intensity evolves. And let me show uh, in these different points during uh, propagation, I, I show only on axis uh, situations of the laser pass, uh, how seriously it is distorted. This is only the envelope. This is not the carrier, uh, carrier uh, wave yet the envelope distorts uh, to such a degree so uh, we cannot uh, expect some nice high harmonic spectrum uh, only at single dipole level we can see along the rising edge of the pass how different ionic species generate their own dipoles this uh, bear in mind that these are uh, uh, of the higher the dipoles generated with, with the higher charges are multiplied because otherwise they are not uh, visible but uh, what did i do what but uh, the uh, but the combined dipole spectrum of all the ionic species finally leads to a so-called multi-plateau uh, high harmonic spectrum this is an interesting case and these uh, pulses again are are at hand already uh, the macroscopic buildup of uh, these elemental uh, dipole emissions uh, consists the third big part of uh, our uh, uh, modeling um, the emitted dipoles propagate in the same medi medium together with the driving pulse therefore a similar kind of wave equation equation has to be solved for uh, the harmonic uh, for the harmonic field uh, the easier thing is that the source term here uh, is the nonlinear dipole which is already calculated it is known so there is no need for uh, for a self consistent iterative method uh, to solve it um, after we solve this uh, equation for each spectral component of the harmonic field uh, it uh, the medium is uh, 
over uh, the XUV's exit from the interaction medium, and then they are transported uh, to the detection. Uh, we call it to the far field, and we use the ABCD ray matrix formalism and uh, so of the Henkel uh, integral here, we can include refocusing uh, whatever uh, is the actual, the real experimental configuration uh, for this case. A very important uh, part is the time-dependent phase matching analysis uh, of uh, this model. We know from the seminal paper of uh, Philippe Baku and co-workers that they uh, constructed, they gave a, a static model for the phase matching. And the condition for a perfect phase matching is when the wave vector uh, of the Q's order harmonic is exactly equal to the wave vector of the polarization. Now, the time-dependent generalization of this uh, static model um, takes into account that um, uh, takes into account the modifications of the fundamental electric field, and um, we use here a spectrally averaged uh, phase and intensity uh, for the uh, laser field, and both of these are obtained from the propagated solution of the of the wave equation, which was the first point of uh, uh, of this modeling. The phase met the degree of phase matching is quantified by the phase mismatch or its uh, inverse. Uh, uh, quantity, the coherence length. And as a practical guide, we say that there is good phase matching uh, in the, those cases when the coherence length uh, is comparable to the generation medium's length. Uh, this is a paper where many papers, but I just highlighted one where we uh, studied uh, uh, in detail these phase matching effects. Let me show two cases, very representative cases, two very different cases, but uh, both of them are real cases. The first one I named case long uh, because this is uh, uh, the long focusing beam line, uh, one beam line very similar to the silos at uh, Eli Alps. This uses an 800 nanometer driver. And here, the goal is to optimize uh, the XUV efficiency around certain energy we picked up uh, for 40 electron volts. The second case, we call it lighthouse case. This is a compact beam line with tight focusing, uses mid-infrared driving pulse. And the goal is to demonstrate uh, the attosecond lighthouse effect. Here, I just summarize uh, uh, their parameters just to uh, show at a glance that they are totally different. Uh, for this uh, long case, we did a multi-parameter scan, and I just pick up one uh, from the many parameter combinations. Please observe here the strong surface modulation of the input laser pass and its intensity clamping. And let's, uh, this, these are the graphs I already showed uh, at the motivation point. Uh, how different are already the dipole spectra uh, of these, uh, let's say, two passes or, or the non-modified and the modified uh, uh, passes at the beginning at the end, at the end of the propagation. And the, micro, uh, the macroscopic high harmonic spectra are not even remembering of the dipole spectra, but what we can see uh, is that at a certain propagation distance, which is four centimeters in this uh, particular case, uh, somehow emissions around 40 electron volts, which is harmonic 25, they somehow find good phase matching conditions and, and here the signal is optimized. Let's see how this happens, both in time and in space. Let's see the spatial evolution of the driver pass. This is the same uh, quantity, the peak intensity of the driver in two representations, because I want then you to compare uh, the shape of the driving pass with the shape, spatial shape, spatial build up of, um, 
of this uh, harmonic 25 and please observe here where the gradient of the field has a certain value, there this harmonic finds good phase matching conditions. Let's see uh, whether the coherence length calculations confirm this, confirm this. And let's bear in mind that this phase matching calculation, this coherence length calculation is a completely independent way of uh, uh, verifying uh, what happens uh, in the macroscopic model. Let's see what happens in time. Look at this pulse shape and observe that uh, exactly in those few optical cycles, few optical half cycles, the best emissions occur exactly when the ionization degree and consequently the uh, refractive index of the medium changes most rapidly. And exactly in these optical cycles with gray, we have in the near field the best, the strongest high harmonic emission. These are time and radial uh, representation. And if these emissions are collimated and are with low divergence, they will uh, sum up around the optical axis in the far field and give a strong um, high harmonic signal exactly uh, on axis. I want to stress that all these information are really unavailable experimentally, so our modeling can be of real help. Two uh, minutes, please, Kathleen. Two minutes. Okay, then one minute uh, for the lighthouse case. Um, this is another configuration we used here, uh, mid-infrared passes, because these are much more sensitive to the changes in the refractive index of the medium. And the main goal here is uh, at the lighthouse effect, if you are not familiar with it, is to radially separate successive attosecond emissions uh, so that there is no need for further spectral um, filtering in order to obtain single attosecond pass, but these su temporally successive emissions will uh, radially uh, separate and naturally give rise to um, single attosecond passes. Let's see, uh, again, uh, please observe the very strong cell phase modulation during propagation. This is only one millimeter medium. So it's not centimeters, not meters, one millimeter argon medium, but being it uh, mid-infrared pulse, it is uh, much more sensitive to these uh, um, modifications of the refractive index. And uh, uh, the spatial map of the laser peak intensity is uh, very nice because after a short uh, distance of propagation, it drops and it enters a so-called self-guiding uh, regime, which is macroscopically uh, very uh, advantageous for the uh, buildup of uh, certain harmonics, which uh, here we can see it's uh, above uh, 100 electron volts, which can be a, a, a real treasure for further applications. How this um, how this uh, uh, lighthouse effect uh, uh, occurs. The wave front of the basic mid IR during propagation, uh, the wave front is uh, distorted, it rotates, and all these waveform, uh, wave, uh, waveform rotations or pass, pass front rotations uh, are inherited, are transmitted to the uh, high harmonic dipoles, and in successive half optical cycles, uh, these uh, high harmonic emissions are uh, emitted with, with uh, increasing divergence. And if they have different divergence, then in the far field, they separate uh, radially. Uh, these are uh, several sections of, uh, of uh, this uh, uh, radial separation. This is not perfect. Of course, it is not perfect um, uh, radial separation, but uh, we wanted to stress that we did not use any external dispersive element like a glass wedge, which is usually used. But uh, this is the way how the natural uh, macroscopic propagation effects facilitate this uh, uh, attosecond lighthouse effect. In conclusion, we presented this 
three-dimensional uh, three non-adiabatic model where macroscopic propagation effects are taken into account. The reshaping of the basic, the fundamental pulse is taken into account. And then we see how it's reshaping um, affects the uh, single dipole and, of course, the macroscopic buildup of uh, harmonic radia uh, radiation. And uh, I presented three case studies, one for the multiple ionization, one for the optimization of a long focusing beam line, and one case uh, to demonstrate the attosecond lighthouse effect. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Adeline. That's a uh... Yeah, it's very interesting to see all the details of actually how the laser interacts with a molecule or atom that, of course, those of us who simulate molecular properties ignore totally. <laughs> so we have time, I think, just for one very quick question. If someone has a, a very quick question before we sort of move on. Because if not, given the time, we will come on to our last talk of this session. So uh, just to finish off, we have Jakub Bender, who I believe is in Prague. He may have said at the beginning. All right. So Jakub, over to you. OK, so um, in this last talk, uh, I will conclude the section with uh, another um, presentation about the armetric theory, it was, which was reviewed by Jimena at the beginning of this session. Um, the subtitle of this talk is uh, Time Independent R Matrix Multiphoton Ionization Formalism, which actually might be a little bit more descriptive than the main title. Uh, in other words, uh, I will be talking about uh, perturbative uh, um, calculations in the R Matrix uh, method. Uh, I will build on what uh, Jimena already said, but I will generalize uh, the one photon results to higher orders. For the calculations uh, or imp implementation of this method, we used uh, the UKRML Plus program suite, which uh, allows us to take advantage of uh, the full generality of uh, the possible targets that can be used, atoms, molecules, bigger things, as well as uh, the methods of their quantum chemical descriptions. So, um, as I said, I will not venture beyond the domain of the weak fields, uh, and I will begin the so the first section will be illustration of the method on a few uh, motivating results uh, containing mainly cross sections uh, on atoms and molecules. In the second part, I will touch a related topic, a multi-photon multi process uh, called Trebit, and uh, I will explain how the method actually works uh, in the last, uh, last part uh, as much as the time allows. So, First of all, I, I start with very simple uh, results. Here we see both uh, below and above threshold ionization cross sections for two photon ionization of atoms, uh, the hydrogen and uh, the helium atom, uh, compared, calculated by the R matrix, the new, newly developed R matrix approach, and compared to results from other researchers, other calculations, we see a very, very nice agreement, except perhaps uh, the, the higher energies in the case of helium, where uh, this uh, de deviation from uh, other calculations is not really a sign of a breakdown of the method, uh, rather uh, it's a limitation of this particular calculation, which used a specific uh, Gaussian basis set for characterization of the ionic states of the helium. And this particular basis set is uh, not sufficiently diffuse to describe highly excited states of helium, which then manifests as uh, the deficiency in description of the core excited resonances. Uh, however, as I said, uh, with uh, the UKRML Plus package, we are not limited to atoms and can go straight uh, to molecules in the same way. So here, uh, another motivating example, one, two, three, and four photon ionization cross section uh, for hydrogen in a static exchange or single channel uh, approximation uh, and for a specific polarization parallel to the internuclear axis. Uh, equally well as the static exchange model, we can go uh, to higher models thanks to the flexibility 
of uh, the configuration description in UKML Plus. And so here uh, I, I show the photo ionization cross sections for the two photo ionization of H2, but in full CI uh, approach. Uh, in the leftmost figure, in the leftmost part of that figure, you may recognize uh, the curve that you have seen already in presentation of Jimena. However, here uh, the cross sections are extended uh, to much uh, larger range of energies above the ionization threshold. We compare our results here again to calculations uh, by other researchers. Uh, however, this time there are actually no results, or we have found none uh, results for the above threshold ionization, which uh, leads us to um, comforting um, feeling that we are the first to actually calculate uh, these. So that would be the motivation. Uh, now, a uh, second part uh, focused on a uh, rabbit uh, experiment. So the rabbit uh, process is uh, one plus one, I would say, uh, absorption of two photons where the first one has large energy, is an, it's an ultraviolet photon and uh, it ionizes the molecule and the photoelectron, which is released from the molecule, then absorbs or emits another photon, a low energy one um, in infrared. So if there are multiple uh, XUV wavelengths, uh, this experiment can give rise to interference phenomena for two different pathways, which are uh, shown here in the figure. And uh, this then manifests in as, as uh, beating in sidebands observable in the photoionization yield that depends on the relative phases of the fields. As, as it is introduced here, this is a two photon process. So of course, for a correct char characterization of uh, this process, a two photon or second order theory is uh, necessary. So the objective of uh, the rabbit experiment is the measurement of the so-called time uh, sideband time delay for which a formula is uh, here on this slide. Uh, in absence of accurate two photon or second order, theory or also for purpose of analysis, it's uh, customary to split this sideband time delay into so-called uh, molecular delay and measurement delay. There are different names also for these quantities. The molecular delay can be calculated, for example, by here formula from Baikusheva and Werner, uh, 2017, where the molecular delay is expressed in terms of the quantity B which is uh, nothing less than some combination of uh, the partial wave uh, one photon uh, transition amplitudes and uh, of course some angular uh, momentum al algebra. It's interesting that uh, one can find in this algebra, uh, in this uh, formula, uh, resolution of identity, which can be summed uh, to provide actually a result that this B is directly proportional to the one photon uh, amplitude, one photon transition dipole element together with uh, the observation that uh, the molecular time delay is actually uh, nothing less than nothing else than the discrete uh, approximation of the energy derivative. Uh, it can lead us to conclusion this, that this uh, molecular time delay introduced in Baikusheva and Werner uh, is actually the same quantity as uh, what is referred to the one photon or Wigner delay defined by means of the first order amplitude. Besides uh, this molecular delay, we talk also about the measurement delay for which there are different formulas because being an approximation, it can have uh, different forms. So for example, here uh, again, Bekusheva and Werner provide uh, this fairly complex expression, which is target independent and only depends on the uh, mom momenta of uh, the electron before and after absorption of the second photon. So uh, yeah, as I said, uh, different authors uh, provide uh, different formulas. So the advantage uh, of uh, having access to, to uh, an accurate second order theory as, as we do as, is the one that I am uh, uh, showing to you here is that we don't need to split this side, sideband time delay into these, these two contributions. 
and we can calculate uh, or simulate the process directly by means of the two photon amplitudes. And this is, for example, what we have done for the hydrogen molecule. So here in this plot, you see several things. First of all, the black curve, uh, the dashed one, is a calculation of the sideband time delay for specific polarization and orientation of emission uh, in the time-dependent code that uh, Jimena introduced uh, as well at the beginning of this session. And uh, we, we show here also the results of the newly developed uh, second-order R matrix uh, time-independent theory in blue. And we see that uh, apart from some divergence in, in the high energy region, these two uh, converge very nicely together uh, in the limit of low energies. However, this can be set uh, for the approximations, for the, for the splittings. We calculate it with the same model, a static exchange model. We calculate it the first order um, uh, delays, which are the purple curve, and attempted to add all available uh, measurement corrections to this first order delay. And even though eventually at high energies, uh, these converge very well to the second order results at low energies, uh, they just can't compete with the full uh, second order theory. When we move to a more complex model, the full CI model in hydrogen, uh, the picture does not change much, except perhaps it becomes a little bit messy due to the presence of the resonances. But uh, we see that, again, the time-dependent calculation, the black curve, uh, and the time-independent second-order calculation uh, are very, very uh, close to each other in contrast to any approximation, any asymptotic approximation that uses uh, the splitting of the sideband time delay. This, um, uh, these time delay um, energy dependencies have very often quite interesting uh, properties or features. Here we see a very wide uh, hill-like structure at around 40 electron volts of the photoelectron kinetic energy. This, uh, this feature is caused by interference of partial weights or partial contributions to uh, the total uh, transition dipole element. Uh, the P wave and F wave uh, interfere at around 40 electron volts, giving rise to rapid changes in the total phase. And uh, this is actually related to the fact that uh, the P wave uh, dramatically decays uh, with a minimum at around 70 electron volts. And uh, that, that is related to a destructive in multicenter interference uh, for photoionization of a diatomic molecule as discussed uh, in this, this reference. We performed a similar calculation also for a different molecule, for the nitrogen molecule. Um, this time, the figure is a little bit clear. Uh, there is just the first order, second order, and the time-dependent calculation. And we again see that the black uh, calculation, the time-dependent one from RMT, agrees very nicely, follows very closely the second order uh, calculation uh, from the time-independent in code. Uh, apart uh, from a similar uh, interference structure uh, at uh, 50 electron volts, <clears throat> We also see uh, a new, new feature here at 20 electron volts of the photoelectron kinetic energy. And this one is actually related to the presence um, of uh, a shape resonance in the F wave or in the uh, L equals to three uh, contribution to the total uh, dipole element. So these were the illustrations of, of the new method. And uh, in this uh, third part, I will uh, try to explain how the method works. <clears throat> um, when dealing with uh, multiphoton amplitudes, we are calculating matrix elements uh, like this. So it's a matrix element of a chain of uh, dipole operators and Green's functions of increasing energy. And as we have heard in a talk uh, uh, by Andrei Michalic yesterday, a very nice talk, 
uh, on, the, on, on a similar topic. Uh, these metrics elements can be calculated uh, by means of a sequence of a solution of sequence of uh, Schrodinger equations, uh, driven ones, and uh, this is followed by uh, evaluation of a single dipole element between uh, the so-called final or the last intermediate state and the final uh, photoionization uh, time independent scattering state. So all these uh, Schrodinger equations are more or less the same. On the right hand side, there is uh, either the initial state and the dipole operator or uh, the previous intermediate state. And uh, on the left hand side, there is the unknown intermediate state of, uh, uh, of one by, by one higher order. The, the main task of uh, this multi-photon R matrix method is then to calculate uh, or solve this equation at each iteration, at each uh, uh, photon absorption order. And uh, this is done in the following way. So as, as uh, shown by Kimena, we use a specific channel expansion in the out region because we here we assume that only one electron can be present, the photoelectron, and uh, hence we can combine the total wave function from the channels where the radial uh, function of the photoelectron multiplies some channel functions, which are a combination of the ionic state function of the residual ion states and uh, the angular or spin angular uh, part of the photoelectron wave function. In uh, the inner region on the constraint, we expand the wave function, all of them, the, the known and the unknown wave function in uh, terms of uh, so-called uh, inner region or R matrix eigenstates. These eigenstates are properly anti-symmetric and um, uh, multi-electron states, which include as many correlation as, as we want as, and as we put in by um, choice of a correct or useful um, quantum chemical model. And uh, they are eigenstates of the total many electron Hamiltonian augmented by so-called block operator, which uh, makes the total operator Hermitian uh, in the inner region. One important uh, part about this method uh, is that uh, in the outer region, so beyond the, ra the radius of uh, the inner region, we assume that we can consider only the central Coulomb potential. So uh, at this moment, we disregard any possible dipole or multiple potentials, which is uh, mostly fine because the Coulomb potential is typically much stronger and uh, dominates the interaction. The method proceeds uh, then by splitting the right hand side. Uh, the right hand side is expressed as a sum of uh, the source that is constrained to the inner region and its complement that is constrained to the outer region. So it's really spatially separated by the R matrix region. And uh, having the right hand side uh, as a combination of uh, two terms, we also expect that uh, the solution at, uh, for example, the boundary between the regions and also uh, for higher high ID will be a combination of solutions generated by these two separate sources. To be more specific, uh, in the out region uh, where there is, as I said, uh, we use the channel expansion and there is no uh, dipole or higher multiple coupling, this uh, multi-electron Schrodinger equation decouples into a set of independent one electron wave functions. And uh, because the only potential in this out region is uh, the Coulomb potential, we can actually solve these equation, these one electron equations by means of the Coulomb Green's function as uh, written here at the bottom of the slide. Um, this integral uh, can be actually calculated analytically, and I will come to that uh, in a moment. Regarding the second part, the, the inner part of the right hand side or the source term, uh, we observe uh, that uh, in the outer region, 
it will manifest only as a source for purely outgoing waves that uh, uh, leave the inner region and uh, propagate uh, through the outer region. So we can say that the part of the solution in the outer region, which is generated by the inner region uh, part of the right hand side in each channel, so this is a projection into channel, is uh, proportional to an outgoing quantum wave in case of open channel or to the exponential decaying uh, Whittaker function for closed channels. As I said before, these two solutions can be combined. So uh, together, we expect that in the outer region, uh, the, the unknown wave function can be expressed by means of the known uh, intermediate state from the previous absorption order uh, by this, these formulas in for, for open and closed channels. And the only unknown element here is uh, the coefficient of proportionality, this IP which needs to be found. On the so that solution is valid in, in the full uh, out region. And uh, this means that it's also valid on the boundary of uh, between the inner and outer region. And as such, uh, and thanks to the continuity of the unknown solution or the assumed continuity, uh, we can replace it at the boundary of uh, the uh, inner region by the inner solution because they are equal there. So we get at the armatrix boundary such conditions for uh, projections of the inner solution in, into the one electron channels that they are proportional to an outgoing Coulomb wave and augmented by some analytic, analytically calculable uh, integral containing a single channel uh, Green's function. This equation can be uh, reorganized by transferring uh, the integral term from right hand side to left hand side. And we see that uh, this expression on the left hand, left hand side needs to be proportional via some unknown coefficient to the outgoing wave or exponentially decreasing one. Uh, so the right hand side is unknown function, but uh, the right hand side has a known logarithmic derivative because when we, we calculate the logarithmic derivative of the right hand side, the, the coefficient will cancel, of course. And it turns out that by some miracle, uh, requiring that the logarithmic derivative of this circle term is equal to this known logarithmic derivative of uh, some asymptotic functions is uh, quite enough to solve uh, for the inner region. I will not show the full uh, full exposition. Uh, just uh, this is uh, the uh, these are the equations when put all, all together. So we see here uh, at the top of the boxed uh, region that uh, this is uh, the equation for the expansion coefficients of the unknown solution in the inner region uh, in terms of uh, the R matrix eigenstates. It features uh, various uh, things like eigenstates of uh, the inner region eigenstates, uh, a modified block operator, which includes the required uh, logarithmic derivative. And on the right hand side, there is the uh, inner region part of uh, the right hand side projected into a specific, a specific uh, eigenstate. I see that Graham uh, turned his uh, camera on. I think I still have uh, quite uh, some time, no? Okay. <laughs> uh, so, and uh, having having uh, the inner region expansion coefficients, we can easily calculate the outer region wave function uh, as a projection on the channels. I mentioned that uh, the method requires calculation of some analytic integrals. Uh, these are actually quite um, <clears throat> intimidating ones because uh, they are infinite integrals of widely oscillating functions, which can even diverge. However, this, these integrals can be regularized uh, using an exponential damping factor. And uh, it, seem, it turns out that in the limit uh, where this exponential damping factor uh, disappears, the integrals stay, stay finite and uh, well-defined. 
To calculate these integrals, we use asymptotic expansion for the uh, coulomb pankel functions, which looks like this, which transform the integrals uh, into the uh, into integrals containing just exponentials and some uh, relatively slowly varying uh, functions of uh, the coordinate. And these can be calculated uh, by means of the method of uh, IMAR and counts uh, from 30 years ago, uh, which uh, amounts to calculating a few terms of uh, int integration by parts. And uh, this uh, converges very, very fast and just the two or three terms of uh, this are actually required. For higher transitions than two electron, the two, two photon ones, we need uh, much uh, more complicated integrals, multidimensional integrals of, again, coulomb henkel functions and coulomb greens functions. These can be, again, uh, expressed using the asymptotic, asymptotic um, development of the coulomb uh, wave functions uh, in terms of exponentials. And it turns out that uh, these integrals can be calculated uh, in the recursive way because we have seen uh, on the previous slide that uh, the one dimensional integral of uh, the exponential times something is eventually exponential times something again, which can be merged with uh, the next integrand and uh, calculated this way uh, in, in turns. There are some limitations to this method. Uh, I mentioned, well, analytical integration and asymptotic expansions. These uh, are quite uh, fine if uh, the R matrix radius is sufficiently large, because then all these uh, asymptotic formulas converge very well. Uh, if we are too close to the molecule, uh, these uh, formulas do not converge, but we can help it very simply. We can just calculate those integrals numerically in some finite region between two different radii and uh, use the analytic integration onward. And uh, this, uh, this uh, solves the problem. So uh, here are just a very, very simple example for two photon ionization of hydrogen calculated with our matrix radius 15, that's the blue curve. But once we extend uh, the inner region, or as if uh, shorten the outer region to, by means of the numerical integration to 150, we get results that are indistinguishable from uh, results obtained with in region uh, size uh, 150. There are some other limitations. Of course, I mentioned that we are dealing with low intensities only. Uh, we are in the perturbation theory. Uh, we use dipole approximation, and as you, as you have seen, uh, length gauge. And uh, this all is valid for fixed nuclei, but nothing prevents us from doing, uh, say, uh, vibrational averaging. To sum up, so uh, we derived a new method based on the R matrix approach that is applicable to both atoms and molecules. It is time dependent, and it can calculate uh, more or less arbitrary multi-photon ionization amplitudes. The fact that it's time independent, of course, makes it computationally efficient because otherwise these, uh, these uh, quantities were often calculated using time dependent methods, which uh, take quite some time. I mean, computational one, uh, right? So it's based on a separation of uh, the uh, multi-photon multi matrix element into a sequence of Schrodinger equations. The proper boundary condition is embedded at the boundary of the inner region by means of a modified block operator. And uh, we also provide a recursive algorithm that evaluates uh, multidimensional free free integrals needed for uh, treatment of the outer region um, to complement the wave functions. We applied this method to multi-photon cr cross-section calculation for hydrogen atom and molecule and for helium atom. And I've also, sh also shown some uh, two photon transitions in the rabbit experiment for uh, hydrogen and nitrogen. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention and, um, and sharing. Thank you very much, Jakob. Um, okay, so it's time for a couple of questions before we stop. So how much should you choose the 
the R matrix radius? Because they sort of seem to say that obviously, obviously you should get the same results sort of whatever you choose it. But what, what guides you in how close in or, you know, where you put it? Well, I, I think that the best answer is that we do ideally some uh, radius convergence test. So okay. we, we try several radii and see from what region, from what radius uh, the results are unaffected. Okay. Uh, normally, normally it's enough if uh, the in region actually contains uh, all electron density, but uh, sometimes it's useful to extend it. Yeah, yeah, and you don't want to go too far out because then you need a really large, long outer part. And so, yes. okay, so it's just that. Yeah, it's a bit of trial and error. <laughs> yes. Uh, Hans Jakob. Yes, thank you for the nice talk, Jakob. Um, very nice presentation, great results. I have a comment and a question. So first, the, the comment is indeed, so the finite difference uh, approximation is not a small approximation, in particular when you have resonances, as you nicely showed also in, in H2, for example. And in our paper that you cited with Denitza, we showed this quite explicitly because we showed that there are very big differences in the two photon and one photon delays in the case of N2O that we studied experimentally back in 2016, where we showed that the rabbit time delays contain information about the lifetime of shape resonances. And we showed that in that case, in that specific case, although you have a very broad shape resonance, there is a big difference between the two photon and one photon delays, even after taking into account the CC delay. And that comes because of a failure of this finite difference approximation. And that will be much more significant when you have narrow resonances, of course, because then you have rapid variations and the, the finite difference approximation becomes almost meaningless. And the other case where it seems to me there is a very big difference between one photon and two photon delays is in the angular result of time delays. Because as you may know, in the case of helium, um, there is a strong angle dependence to the two photon time delays, also those measured by rapid. And there is, of course, no time delay at all in the Wigner delay itself because of the spherical symmetry of 1s. And this is even more significant in, case, in the case of molecules. So in molecular frame time delays, uh, where there is essentially no direct co correspondence between one photon and two photon at the simple level. And so my, my question after this long comment is, uh, do you, have you done calculations in the molecular frame? Is this possible with your code? Um, well, yes, yes, we can do, we can do that. Uh, we, d we have done only calculations that you have seen. So we have nothing, uh, nothing hidden yet, but we plan to do, to do more. And we definitely will revisit uh, this uh, rabbit time delays again. So. Uh, okay, then I look forward to seeing that and hearing from you. Thank you. Okay, All right. Seeing as we are running a few minutes late, if there are no other questions, I say, or I suggest you leave all of your questions and go to the meet to the speaker rooms to ask whatever you would like. Uh, and otherwise, just leaves me to thank the speakers from this morning's session. So, Jimena, Alex, Kathleen, and, and Jakub, for your great presentations. And I think everyone is due back. Well, it's now fifty minutes time at. Uh, 140 for some more R matrix calculations. <laughs>